All right, shall we? Why don't we begin then? In the name of the Father, don't worry about it. Don't worry about a stand. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Just uh, stop and quiet ourselves for a moment and ask that God's Holy Spirit would be with us. Lord, that you would allow our minds and our hearts to be opened, that we would encounter you as you encounter us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. So, uh, welcome everybody. So, this is the first stage of our workshop. So, we have two series. So, this workshop, a little bit of break, another workshop. Workshops are supposed to be somewhat interactive. So, I'm supposed to ask questions, and you guys are supposed to answer them. Amen. 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 So, the interactive part is, I'm just going to put the microphone here. And I'm going to sit down, and then somebody else will come up here and fill it up. Not that, not that interactive. Um, so, yeah, so they, they've invited us to just try to be able to communicate a little bit of information, but then also have a dialogue in being able to talk about the particular topic that we're going to be talking about. So it's my blessing to be with you. Uh, so we're clear that uh, we prayed at the beginning that your heart and your mind could be open, so that not necessarily you're only touched by what, what's necessarily said, but also by what's heard. And by that, I mean sometimes God can say something to you. God can show you something. It might not be what I actually said, but God works in that. Amen? So you have to do your work as well. I've done what I needed to do, hopefully, about praying about what to say and what we're supposed to do this afternoon. So I've done my part. Now, your part is to be able to open your mind and your heart so as to be able to hear what God has to say. Amen? Amen. The other thing that's nice about that is it takes off all the pressure on me. So I can give a horrible talk, and if you get something out of it, that's because God's working. Amen? So just let me get a sense real quick who's here. Okay, so all the priests, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Think of the workshop, people. Think of the workshop. Come on, people. That's all right. That's all right. We'll, we'll work through this, okay? Um, now, my suspicion is the next one we're going to do a little bit better. All the, pro- all the prophets raise their hand. Ah, yes. Yes. And all the kings raise their hand. This is a quick group. This is a quick group. This is going better than I thought, okay? So that's basically all I wanted to say. So everybody can have a great night, right? So now, if I were to ask you, my suspicion, if I were to ask you, the greatest event of your life. I mean, we have all kinds of answers, and you probably, given the topic, you know where I'm going to go. But I want to suggest that the greatest event of our life is baptism. Is baptism. And what takes place in baptism for us is, is really the, at the heart of what we're going to talk about the rest of the afternoon. Is what it is, and, and for us to be able to actually step into that, the grace of baptism. Now, again, if I was to ask you and you had no idea what the greatest event of your life, some of you would, I'm sure you would say your, your wedding day, right? That's what you told me to say, right, Mike? That's what I thought. Your wedding day, right? Oh, that, oh you're, a, you're a rock star. Seriously. So now watch me not use it the whole time. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you. Right. So that great, uh, the greatest moment, uh, the birth of your child uh, could be graduation. I don't know what it is, right? This morning, I had the, uh, just a wonderful opportunity to, I wasn't able to be here this morning, uh, celebrate the 25th we- uh, vows anniversary of two Franciscan sisters that in many ways I grew up with. And to be able to celebrate that with them was a wonderful, wonderful celebration, a great day. But it all in comparison to baptism. That what takes place in baptism. Now, I'm going to guess, well, real quick, who is actually, who here remembers their baptism? That's really, really cool. How old are you? Eight. All right. That's cool. Anyone? uh, Yeah. You're 29. 30. Do I have 35? 35. Who would be five? Yeah. 32. You're five. Cool. Yeah. See, what a great blessing, right, to be able to remember our baptism. I was uh, two weeks. I was born uh, February 1st, baptized on Feast of St. Valentine. Yeah. So. Unfortunately, I think that the, there's no doubt that we have the grace, right, the grace that we experience in the baptism. But to actually be able to remember that and to be able to kind of participate that. I had an occasion a number of years ago, I've done some work in China, 
and working predominantly with the underground church. And this one particular occasion, uh, it's a kind of a long story, but I'm going to make it a lot briefer. This, this one gal who was helping me, touring me around, was my translator. And I was talking of this conversation with a nun that I was with. And I just asked a really, really kind of general question. I said, you know, in, in China with the underground church, what do you do if you want to be baptized? And this lady gets up, she runs across the room, and she says, I want to be baptized. And I said, I I'm sorry? She goes, I want to be baptized. And the nun looks at me and says, it's up to you, Father. I'm thinking, I don't know. Like, no, seriously, nowhere in seminary did they say, okay, if you're working with the underground in China and, church, and, and, and somebody comes, this is what you're supposed to do. Didn't talk about it once, right? So I said, well, I think I need to have a conversation with this lady. So we had this beautiful conversation, and she shared how, and I'm not going to ask you this, but she said, Father, I've read most of the catechism. Now, I'm not going to ask you here who's read most of the catechism, because I'm sure you've all read most of the catechism. <laughs> You all know what the catechism is. Exactly, exactly. Things are going great, okay? So, so she just began to share, and she kept on saying, um, I get to become new, right? Like, I, I would be new. If I was baptized, I, I would be new. I said, yes. She asked me could I, if she could go to confession, and I shared with her, actually, that you get one free one, right? So you don't have to. <laughs> then she said, beautifully, could I talk about it? And there were some things that she needed to talk about. There were some things that she needed to be reconciled in her own mind and her own heart. And as we were talking, as she was getting more excited, I found myself that there was no way, right? There's no way that I'm going to tell this, this woman that she can't be baptized. So we opened up the door, and there was a bunch of other women who were outside, and they were just kind of leaning in, like, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on, right? And I said, I think we're going to have a baptism. And they're all excited. So the next morning, we didn't, it was, we didn't have a church that we're using. So their baptismal font was this little blue bowl that they uh, bathed babies in, right? Because this was a place where, a little orphanage. Little, I remember a, a brown bear that was on the bottom of the, of the baptismal font, which was one of the most beautiful baptismal fonts that I've ever seen to this day. But I'll never forget her leaning over to be baptized and her tears rolling down her cheek into the water, right? And when she was finished saying, this is a dream come true, right? This father, this is a dream come true. She would later share with me that the first time she had ever heard the name of Jesus, she was a little girl in a village and there was a preacher coming through. And the preacher spoke of Jesus and she had never heard Jesus' name before, but what, she, what the preacher spoke about was, it was not you who chose me, it was I who chose you. And she said she heard that and she said to herself, I wished I would have been chosen. I wish somebody would have chosen me. And she again begins to weep and says, this is a dream come true. She understood the beauty and the grace and the dignity that there is in baptism. But I suspect all too often, we don't give it enough reflection. We don't take some time just to be able to pray. So if you hear nothing else, I would invite you in the next couple of days to just to be able to stop and to be able to pray and to be able to think about what takes place when we're baptized. We are fundamentally changed, right? So the person who is five minutes before the baptism is different than the person five minutes after the baptism, right? The person becomes conformed to Christ, that we become transformed, we are ontologically changed in baptism, right? So that when God looks upon us, he sees his son. I think there's a danger that in one way we think that when we're baptized, a little bit of Jesus is placed in us, right? So no, 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 we are placed in him, that we are grafted to him, right? So that when God looks upon us, he sees the nature of his son because we are baptized into the person of Jesus, we have discussions, is so-and-so, are they Christian? Are they, if they've been baptized, they're Christian, amen? Whether or not we're faithful to that is a whole other question. But if we've been baptized, we are baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we are changed. So we enter into that water, literally we are dead, and we come out of that water alive. Now, most of us have not experienced that because we experience it as babies and we don't remember it. And yet when you listen to the story of somebody who's experienced that as an adult, there's something that's really profound about that. And I will suggest, I'll talk about that this evening, that that in fact can be what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does for us, right? It allows us that experience of this encounter that I was dead and now I'm alive. Amen? Amen. So when we're baptized, we become... In altus Christus, we become another Christ, right? 
So if you are not comfortable with that, it's something you need to be pray. You need to be able to pray with. You are another Christ. What does Christ mean? Anointed, right? Right. So, are you comfortable with saying that you are another Christ? Really? Didn't sound like it. It's like yes, because you know that's the right answer, but you're not so sure, right? The word itself means. Christ, the, the word itself means the anointed one, right? So when in the scriptures, in the beginning of Matthew, they look and, and Jesus walking and said, behold the Christ, right? He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. And if I am in Christ and at baptism, I become literally anointed, then we are another Christ. He is the Christ. He is the, he is the primordial anointed one, but we participate in that in that we are now in Christ. Amen. So in, in, in the scriptures in the Old Testament, when they speak of the anointed, there were three groups, three classes of people that were anointed. I'll bet you you can guess who they are. Seriously, you guys are good, all right? And all the priests in, the hand ra- in here raised their hands. Okay, all the prophets, kings. I just kind of wonder which one we like most, but we'll deal with that later, right? So Jesus is the anointed one. So when each one of us was baptized, we have heard, and the right says, just as Jesus was anointed priest, prophet, and king, so may you live always as a member of the body of Christ, sharing in everlasting life. So when each one of us was baptized, those words or something like those words were said over us. And I don't get to do a lot of baptisms, just in the nature of my ministry doesn't have me able to do a lot of baptisms. But the ones that I do, One of the things that they said to me in seminary that I actually listened to, that I paid attention to, was um, use the symbols. Let the symbols speak, right? So to be able to take the oil and and, and anoint that child, it's not just, don't just dip your thumb into it. It's like just imagine the scene, right? And pour the oil anointing over that child, right? They become anointed, and you take the chrism, which you're going to be able to smell for a couple of days, right? And you just all, you want a little greased little kid right there. It's hard to hold on to. Okay, it's fantastic, right? But, but to be able to see that, and, and we imagine, you take a look at the Old Testament, and you see the anointing. When David is anointed, they pour oil over his head, and it, and it goes down his beard, right? This is the image, that, that we participate in that. We become the anointed ones. But my concern is that we don't actually step into that. That we don't step into the reality that we are priest, prophet, and king. And we don't understand that this is part of the inheritance that has been given to us by the fact, brothers and sisters, that we are baptized. We participate in the priestly class, in the prophetic class, and we are able to, to participate in the ruling class of kings. Amen? As a priest, as an ordained priest, a sacramental priest, I participate in priest, prophet, and king in a very particular way. I participate that within the life of the church, right? That I offer sacrifice. We're talking about this. I offer sacrifice in the life of the church, and, and I govern as king in the life of the church, and I have a prophetic voice in the life of the church. Your job is to do that outside of the church, Right? That you participate in these, in these class in priest, prophet, and king uh, in the temporal order. As a minister and a priest and ordained, that I participate largely with those who are already Catholic, those who are already baptized, those who are already Christian. Your job is to participate and to bring sanctification, to bring governing, and to bring a prophetic voice into a world that in many ways has no idea what this is about. And in fact, and I'll say near the end, is that your your challenge and your inv- invitation is the possibility of you impacting so many more people than me, right? Because generally when I speak, when I do it, it's because people are coming and they have some idea of what I'm going to say, right? Not necessarily exactly what I'm going to say, but some idea because I'm a priest. I suggest when they hear it from you, it's profoundly different. When they hear a prophetic voice from somebody that's working in their office or somebody that's in the soccer field with them or somebody you're playing golf with, that when you act as a priest and a prophet and a king to that community, it has a profound impact. And what I hope and my desire for you is for you to be able to step into that 
and to be able to claim that and own it. Amen? Amen. So as a catechism reference, Catechism 1267 and to 1268 speaks of us being priest, prophet, and king. Now, what does it look like for us to be priest? First off, we all share by baptism in the priestly call, that it is a call, it is in the nature of baptism. One of the words for priest is this, the, the uh, word is pontificax, this bridge. It means a bridge, that the priest acts is the bridge between man and God. Okay, I act in that role within the church. You act in that world with the, with the uh, lay brothers and sisters that you spend time with, that you fellowship, and then the people that you work with. So just imagine that for a moment, that you are a bridge. And it's the nature of the priesthood. The nature of the priesthood is a bridge. It bridges the gap between God and man. And that the Lord wants you to be able to do that. that. That your job is to lead, again, the temporal order, the world, the people that you come in contact with, from the world that they live in to the divine. And you do that by, partly by the way that you live, that they see in you something that's different, that there's something different about you. There's something different about the way you speak, the way you uh, behave, the way you recreate. I remember when I was in high school, uh, I was raised in Southwest Colorado, and there was a gal there, and uh, the large Mormon community in my community, uh, and there were a bunch of high school guys. I was, not, I was not participating in this because it wouldn't have been appropriate. Uh, but there were a bunch of guys talking about how cute this gal was, and, and maybe I was there, but <laughs> now that I think about it, because I was realizing, how would I have known this? So maybe I was there. <laughs> and one of the guys said, but she won't, they said, she won't do anything because she's Mormon. And we all knew exactly what, she, what they meant, was that we knew because she was Mormon, there were some things that she wouldn't do and some things that she would do. And it seems to me that has to be the nature of, of we who are priests, right? That, that we represent to a society this bridge that reveals something about God, that this gap, this bridge, this gap that exists between the world and God, we need to bridge that. And as priests, we bridge that by reconciling this world that is distant from, the world, from God now to a world that doesn't even know that they have a need for God. I was just talking to one of the people on the team, and, and he was sharing how we're living in such an immoral society. And I want to suggest that it, not only is it an immoral society, it's an amoral society. That there used to be these norms that could be violated, but we live in a world that there are no norms anymore. Do whatever the heck you want, right? And who are we to judge, or who are we to place our opinion on anybody else? Well, that's, that's the world that you get to minister your priesthood, right? That's good luck, all right? <laughs> But, but it's important that we understand that, that, that you are going to be the ones who are going to bridge this gap. We, you, are the bridge to take a world that doesn't know about God and lead them. Literally, they can walk across you to that place that is divine, that place that is sacred. One of the ways that we do these, and these are different elements or characteristics of priest, is by offering, by this offering of a sacrifice or an offering of whatever. So I grew up in my family, my mom has multiple sclerosis, and this sense of offering up was very real for the priest, and we'll talk about this at the, at the Eucharist, at the liturgy, but I as priest offer a sacrifice. I enter into this eternal sacrifice, sacramentally. You do that within your life. And we have to ask ourselves, how is it that we offer up this sacrifice? Now I watched my mom for 47 years offer this sacrifice. And her offering that sacrifice was sanctifying to me, right? That I watched my mother behave as a priest in offering sacrifice for her kids, right? So the days that, that I, one of the, adva I guess, advantages, uh, me and all my brothers and my sister, we all know how to cook. Because the days that my mom wanted to cook, but she wasn't able to, right? So we all pitched in and we learned how to cook. I wish the friars knew how to cook. But that's another story for another day. Hmm. That's my sacrifice, right? <laughs> a buddy of mine's been struggling with some illness late, lately, and um, it was really interesting. He had a really insight, a beautiful insight. He said, I haven't dealt with this well. He said that I don't think that I've been the witness to my wife and to my kids that I could have been. 
He was understanding and he was sharing how he had been complaining a lot, moaning, whining, frustrated, impatient. He realized that as priest, he could have offered this sacrifice differently. This is the invitation that you have as, as a priest, is, is to offer the sacrifice. And the reality, guys, is, is we have these sacrifices. There are opportunities time and time and time again to, quote, unquote, offer things up. Every moment, this world is either graced or it's not, right? Moments are either graced or they're not. So we now have the opportunity. How are we going to approach this? How are we going to be able to offer this up to the Lord? Amen? Amen. Part of the process of priest, of us, is for the sanctification of the people that we encounter, the people that we meet for the same, again, mine is the sanctification of the church. Yours is for the sanctification of the world. And you have a particular task as priest in the world to be a sanctifying body to that world. You are the leaven, if you will. You are the light. Uh, and by the way that you live your life has this impact on people, right? It's the nature of the priest is the process of sanctification. I'm going to take bread and wine. I'm going to pray in the Holy Spirit that that bread and wine is sanctified. It's changed. It's transformed. You are supposed to be able to do the same thing. Particularly within those of you who are married is that the reality is, at least I've heard, that there are times that being married is difficult. No? That's right. Your wife told me, never mind. Not everybody gets to be married to Laura, all right? Okay. So, I had an experience a number of years ago that um, I was working, I was, actually I was working here at the university, and a faculty member came in, and they looked really tired. And I just said to them, I said, you look tired. And they said, well... Let me tell you about my evening. I said, oh, great. So we went to bed. Everything, everything was great. Went to bed, and one of the kids got sick. And they were throwing up, so we had to get up, and we had to you know, clean up the kid and shower them and change their sheets and all that kind of thing. It's like, oh, that must be tough. And they said, well, yeah. And then he wasn't feeling very well, and he was kind of frustrated, so we brought him into bed with us. Again, from a celibate, that was a big mistake. Now, I don't know. That just was a big mistake. It seems to me, leave him in the room, all right? So what ended up happening is, as you expected, the kid got sick again, right? And threw up all over them, threw up on the husband and the wife. So now they all had to, again, I saw this coming. They all had to get out. They had to all shower themselves, clean themselves, change the sheets and all this kind of thing. And he's sharing this with me. That has never happened to me. <laughs> Amen? Ever. I was in charge of the seminarians for a number of years, and I never had one of them come to my door, locked, knocked on the door, crying. Never happened, right? Never had any of them throw up on me. I was sharing with my brother. I said I was telling him this story, and he goes, he's got four kids. He goes, Dave, this was a while ago. He goes, I do not remember the last night I slept without being interrupted by one of the kids. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Why would you sign up for that, right? So that is sanctifying. That is sanctifying, that I am convinced that Christian marriage is impossible without grace. It is impossible, and it's one of the things I think with all that's going on in the world and the nature of marriage and what is marriage and this that, and the other, I think it provides us actually a great opportunity to talk about Christian marriage because Christian marriage is profoundly different than what our world is saying is marriage. Amen? Amen. It is sanctifying. The way that the, the, the mom and dad dealt with their little boy that day, that evening, was sanctifying, right? It caused them and invited them to be transformed. And this is the nature of priesthood. It is sanctifying to those people that we encounter. It is sanctifying to the people that we're in relationship with. The way you treat your spouse, the way you treat your siblings, the way you treat your parents, the way you treat your children should be sanctifying. Why? Because you're a priest. And that's how what priests do. And this is, on a side note, the profound scandal that there is when priests don't do that, right? And we're seeing this on every television and newspaper, right? But the reality is, is the entire priesthood is guilty. Priest, prophet, and king. So we ask ourselves that. Like, I think it's a beautiful custom of parents blessing their kids, of literally, as priests, blessing their kids. 
before they go to bed, I don't know, before they go off to school or whatever it is, there is something about people are coming to me all the time asking for my blessing as a priest. You ought to be able to give your blessing, those of you who have children, to your children because you are the priest of that family. Recently, I was invited to dinner, and I, don't, I was trying to remember where it was, and I can't remember. They asked me to say grace, and I said to one of the parents, I said, this is your home. You're the priest of this home. I'm welcome to say my grace if I have to, but I would suggest that one of you say grace, right? This is, we believe that it is the domestic church. The family is the domestic church, and of which the parents, the mother and father, are the priest of this, right? We need to step in that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the kids come to the parents, yeah. That's cool. She said in her family, as a Portuguese family, that in the morning they would ask the blessing of their parents and then kiss the parents' hands, right? right? At night, too? That's great. That's great. Yeah, and this is actually what I'm going to invite you to, is, is what are ways in your own family, in your own situations, that you can be priest? Right? I mean, we, we place this thrust on me about what, it, as an ordained priest, there are some expectations that you have of me that is eminently reasonable. I push that back to you. To stand as priest. And what does that look like? What does it look like for you as far as the offering of sacrifice? What does it look like for you as standing in the gap? What does it look like for you to be the bridge between God and man? Each one of you is called to be able to do that. And my invitation for you is to take some time and reflect about what that's going to look like for you. Amen? Now, the other is that I obviously have a particular relationship as priest, as an ordained sacramental priest, to the Eucharist. Jesus obviously invites the priest to be able to do this in memory of me, right? But we all, when we gather, it doesn't mean that you're not a priest at the Eucharistic celebration, right? So it's not, you are not just the sightseeing. You don't come to Mass just to sit back and watch. But we as priests, I as an ordained sacramental priest, lead the community, lead the congregation. But we are all priests and we are all making offerings and sacrifice. Amen? One of the cool things that happened one time, and some of you know this story, but I was in Africa, and they do a really cool thing at the offertory in Africa. So they bring up the bread and the wine as we do at every offering at Mass in, in the, the States. But they didn't just bring up the bread and wine. They brought up all kinds of things. They brought up a blanket that this lady made. They brought up uh, fruits and vegetables and grains and all of these offerings. They brought up a live chicken. They're right. There's this chicken. And I'm, they bring me this live chicken. It's like, what do I do with this? All right, this is never right. They bring up a baby. They offer me, they offer me a baby, which is great because I always wanted one, right? <laughs> so they offer me this baby, and I'm like, but what this is, is they are offering everything at the altar. And this is the reality, is that you as priests and celebrating a priest, it's not only the bread and the wine that it's been being offered, but you are offering on the altar, and you are offering things that need to be changed. Your hurts, your fears, your anxiety, your bondage, whatever it is, your question, your fear, whatever it is, all of that is, but you are a priest, amen? And as priest, you offer. You are not sitting on the sidelines watching what Father does, but you are participating in the offering of yourself, right? The early church, the altar was huge, right? And it wasn't just the bread and wine. It was this massive thing that everything was placed on there. Now, we've kind of narrowed it down. But what is it that you're bringing every time you celebrate Eucharist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how would that go over if we just had everybody just kind of come up and do the offering? Probably larger collections because we would guilt you into it. <laughs> which is what we're looking for. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. All right, just do me a favor. Quiet yourself for a second. Lord, we ask that you'd be present with your Holy Spirit. Just in your own mind, to pray about the reality that you have been baptized a priest. And as such, to be able to claim that. To be able to offer sacrifice. 
for those that you love, your children, your siblings, brothers and sisters, people you work with. That you are a bridge. Who are those people in your life that you want to bring across, that you want to play the, bridge the gap between God and them? That you are a light, you are a leaven, that God uses you for sanctification of others. Now, just pray for a second. What would be ways in which you can be priest for those you in relationship with? Family, friends, people you work with. I think what the church invites us to is, is to a deeper, broader understanding. To a commitment to be this for a world that desperately needs it. Amen? Thoughts about that? priest, the idea. Yeah. No, 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 no. Sure. Sure, sure. She said that it's not always received well at times, and that's, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. We'll talk a little bit about at the end when we pray for courage, because for priest, prophet, and king, it takes courage. Yep. That's great. That's great. She blesses her, her grandkids every morning before Mass, before school. That's fantastic. Yeah. Ignatian? I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Standing the gap. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. Great. Great. Mm-hmm. So the couple does that to one another. Great. Mm-hmm. Sure. But to sure, sure, absolutely, and absolutely. And after we listen, we can share, you know, what Christ puts on our hearts for that particular person. Sure. Because every person is different. Sure. So a sense of being a sensitivity and being authentic with them and then just being able to listen, right? Absolutely. Humility goes into it. Right. Again, remembering that as priests, we are priests not of just priests of, of me, of Dave Pavanka. We're a priest of Christ. So we are grafted in him 
and that's what we try to reflect, that we, we have no priesthood apart from Christ. So we celebrate and we participate in the priesthood of Jesus. So all of the interactions is to try to allow the individual to encounter Christ, who is the high priest. Amen? Okay, we're going to keep on going just a little bit more, and we'll have some more time at the end. So all the priests, raise their hand. Excellent, excellent. All right. Uh, all the prophets, raise your hand. Great characteristics of a prophet. They are messengers and they are witnesses. When we pay attention to the Old Testament, a couple of characteristics that we see is the prophet is set apart. The prophet is set apart from a world that, that needs to know, a world that needs to hear, a world that needs to see. And that's one of the things is the prophet is, is the prophet through many ways. One of them is by the way they live their life. Is that our life as prophets should look different. The prophet was set apart to live a life of holiness. Amen? One of the things the Vatican Council did, obviously it restored our understanding of priest, prophet, and king. It also restored this understanding that you, we are created to be holy. Right? It's not just the priests or the religious, that you as baptized are to be holy. Amen? I was doing a priest, uh, excuse me, a, a men's retreat in Columbus, Ohio one time, and I was just talking about the nature of holiness, that all of us are called to be holy. But I asked the question of the community. I said, who here is holy? I said, I invite you. Who here is holy? If you're holy, stand up. And I asked again, anybody, if you're holy, stand up. And like this elderly gentleman's kind of looks around and very sheepishly stands up which is horrible because it ruins my whole talk because what I'm going to ultimately say is we're called to be holy, but nobody stands up, and he stands up. <laughs> so, so afterwards, he comes up to me, and he says, Father, what did you say? I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, what did you say? And I said, well, I said, whoever's holy, stand up. And he goes, oh, I thought you said whoever's elderly to stand up. <laughs> That's figures, right? It just figures, all right? Right? We need to be able to wrestle with this. As a prophet, we are called to be holy, which means we are set apart, that our life is supposed to look different. I want to suggest that when people begin, begin to come up to us and ask us why we do or why we don't do something, the role of being a priest and a prophet is profoundly different because they're recognizing in us that there's something different. And that difference at the heart of a prophet is that he or she is called to be holy, right? Holiness isn't always about doing it perfectly. Holiness is uh, a relationship with God. There's a way that sometimes we, mirror, we always look at holiness as, do you do it right or do you do it wrong? Do you make mistakes or do you not make mistakes? I mean, when we take a look at the scriptures, many of the prophets made all kinds of mistakes, but they would get up, they would start again, they would repent, right? And they would work at being transformed. Holiness isn't about merely being perfect, holiness is about having an intimate relationship with Jesus, right? It's at the heart of it. Holiness has a lot more to do with somebody else and that other person is Jesus than it does me, right? Holiness is that we get lost in this, that I am engrafted and people no longer see I, as, as Paul said, is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Holiness is that recognition that there is Christ alive in the individual, and that we begin to get lost in that. Amen? Amen? Now, one of the things that's important for us is that we have, I think, a danger when we think about holiness. And it's almost like this, like this French butler, okay? Or, or a, a Carmelite, right? Holiness is, you're just, it's just not me, right? right? Whatever holiness is, it's just not, it's like holiness, holy people are a lot more serious than, than I am. Let me just put it that way, right? Holy people they bow a lot more than I do, right? <laughs> holy, holy, holy people have incense. It's just kind of always around them, right? It's just incense. There's just this, this wafting about them, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was a postulant, somebody said to me, this guy was in vows, all right? So if you're a postulant, there is nobody lower than a postulant, right? The postulant is the very low. This guy was in vows. I don't know what I was doing. I was fooling around doing something. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, I used to think you're holy. Now I realize you're an extrovert. She was like. What? But 
As a postulant, that scared me. Because what I thought was, to be holy, I should probably be a lot quieter. And I probably should not have short-sheeted the novices' beds. <laughs> I really shouldn't have done that. A danger, here's a danger, is that when we think of holy people, we think of that person rather than ourselves. And this is the invitation for us as the prophet is that God has called us to be holy, not necessarily perfect. And unfortunately, we equate those and they are not the same. There is one perfect one. Amen. Amen. And that's not us. Right. All right. So what does it look like for you to be holy? And we see the saints and we see in the saints, we see models and examples. But I love what I, I think it was. I, I can't remember what saying it was, so I'm not going to say. It. But the line was, um, to be honored but not imitated. Right? The saint is to be honored, but not, the Lord doesn't call us all to do the same thing. We already have one St. Francis, okay? We don't need another one, right? The Lord is inviting you to be holy with your unique gifts, talents, foibles, fears, all that, all right? So the prophet is holy. The prophet is able to be able to step back from the world and to look at the world and read the signs of the times, to read what's going on, and then to be able to shed light into that. The prophet speaks truth. The prophet brings light into situations that before they entered in were, were murky, were cloudy, were confusing. The prophet has got to be able to speak light into that and to speak truth into that. The prophet is able to look at social issues and say that not everything is right. Not everything is true. Not everything is good. And the prophet needs to be able to speak into that. A danger, and it's one of the things I love about Francis, Francis stands in, uh, St. Francis looks at the, uh, over the Umbrian Valley, and he says, the world is going to be my cloister. The prophet must engage the world. And again, this is your job because you as lay people are in the midst of the world. I, as a religious and a priest, there's, there's this difference, and so the Franciscan does that as well. But you are the one who's going to engage this world that profoundly needs a voice of reason to it right? I took some courses at the University of Pittsburgh a number of years ago, and we we're having this discussion amongst very educated, smart people about how we have, I think at then there was eight genders that they were talking about. So I was sharing, just talking with my brother really casually about this, and my younger nephew was in the back seat, and we we're talking about how this conversation about how we now have eight genders. My nephew says, Uncle Dave, that's just stupid, all right? out of the mouth of babes, right? But we can't speak like that, but we, we need to be light and voice and truth in charity. And we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a lot at the end about charity. All of this must be done with humility and with charity and with a great sense of reverence for the person who's in front of us. But it doesn't mean that we have to believe everything that they say is true. If we are not illuminating light, the light of Christ into this world, who's going to do it, right? I remember as a high school kid, a bunch of my buddies, who's, who's in the mid-50s now? Good. Fast times at Ridgemont High? You are not. <laughs> I just, about halfway into that, I said, oh my gosh, if she is, I'm being in trouble, all right? So, fast times at Ridgemont High. Some of you remember the movie? Yeah, that's right, Sean Penn Spicoli. All right, so it was a, it was, there was nothing good or redeeming about that movie at all. And I remember my father saying to me, me and a bunch of my friends were going to go to it. My dad said to me, is it a good idea for you to go to this movie? And I remember it's like, oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that because now it's like in my mind I have to think about this. And he said to me, he goes, you know, there are times and opportunities where you can say no and it really have an impact on your friends. He didn't say what I could do or what he said, it's up to you. So I went to the movie. But, but what it said to me, is, particularly as a teenager, right? my dad was speaking, that was a prophetic voice. That was a prophetic voice, and I had the opportunity at that time to be a prophetic present that I didn't do very well, right? This is the nature of this, right? One of the funniest shows, I think, on TV right now is Modern Family, and it's, it's well-written, it's funny, it's all these kinds of things, but it is beginning that, that the attitudes of, of the world are beginning to dominate, and if we as Christians don't speak again, in charity, and I will say a billion times, in charity, truth and light in a world that desperately needs it. 
One of the things that Pope uh, John Paul, now St. John Paul, said when he was in St. Louis, he was speaking about truth and freedom. We live in a culture in a world today that says truth is uh, to believe whatever you believe is true. Everybody's, all truth is equal, all truth is the same, all truth is relative. So whatever you believe is true is true. We live in a world that says freedom is the ability to do whatever you want, right? Because we're free, we can do whatever we want. The Holy Father says when truth and freedom are separated, the very moral fabric of our society begins to unravel, which is exactly what's happening, right? We're seeing these two things separated and the very moral fabric of our society is beginning to unravel. We are called to a prophetic voice in the midst of that, right? To bring some sense of order, to bring some sense of truth, goodness, holiness, presence. Uh, and I suggest that particularly in our world, this is very difficult, very difficult. I mean, to see teenage kids to stand up and, and to speak a word of truth and, and about abortion, right, when, when the vast majority of young people just don't believe it's true, I, that takes great courage, great courage. And I, I, I was actually proud, I don't know, the University of Alabama just gave back $21 million that they've been donated to them to this one person who just came out and said um, he was really critical of the state of Alabama because of their abortions. And he said, it's ridiculous, they're backwards, what's wrong with these people in Alabama? The University of Alabama gave back $21 million that this donor had given them and said, we don't want your money anymore, right? That's courageous, right? And that's, that's a state school that's a state school. That's the Crimson Tide. It's not easy for me to, anyway, right? So we, right, we are, you are a prophetic voice. And, and we need to be. One of the lines I love, I love, is of um, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said the Christian is not supposed to be a thermometer of culture, measuring the temperature of a culture, rather, the Christian is supposed to be the thermostat. We set the nature, right? We set the temperature. Unfortunately, we've just been kind of doing this measuring. Brothers and sisters, we need to begin to set that. To we, we as Christian brothers and sisters have got to stop hiding, to stop running away, to stop being silenced, and to speak a word of truth in a world that is just profoundly chaotic, particularly to our young people, right? And the reality is, is like I work a lot with our youth conferences, one of the things that we've done for the last several years is going head on with the major social issue of their day. The reason being is everywhere around their world, their media, their music, their television, their movies are all telling them this is fine. And by the church being silent about this, they implicitly say the church doesn't have anything to say about this. By their moms and dads being silent about this, too many moms and dads abdicating that says the church needs to do this, and they do as well. They're saying mom and dad don't have anything to say about this either, right? So we need to be a prophetic voice for a group of young people that profoundly need us to do that. Amen? Amen. The other thing that the, church, that, that, that the prophet does, um, they, by the way they live their life, give a prophetic voice. And I think we have something particularly within Christian marriage. Lumen Gentium, Article 35, Vatican Council, says that the married couple is a prophetic witness to the life of the church, to a world that needs to see this, right? The way the husband and wife love one another, faithful to one another, lay their down their life for a night. If ever there was a need for a prophetic message, it's in Christian marriage today. Amen? Finally, oh boy, literally finally on that. Um, the other thing that the prophet does is to speak to a world that God is, not merely God was and God will be, right? God is, not God was and God will be. The prophetic voice brings God to the present to a world today, right? Today. The God has something prophetically to say to the world today. Unfortunately, what I think we do is we look to say, well, what did God say 25 years ago? Um, that's one of the things I like working with young people because they don't know what God said 25 years ago and they're willing to listen to what God wants to say today, right? So we need to be as a prophetic voice to be able to make God present to us today. Amen? Amen. Okay, quiet yourself for a moment. Pray for a prophetic voice. Pray that God at this moment, at this moment would show you the arena that he is inviting you into to be a prophetic presence 
by the way you live your life. That you look and sound different. That the Lord would give you the grace to know when to speak and what to say. And give you the grace and courage to say it. Amen? Amen. Francis never said, I preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. Never said it. And the reason I say that is uh, it's important for us to work, use words. Right? That we give proclamation to why we are different. All right? Somebody can look at us and they say, oh, they're different. We need to give a proclamation to what makes us different. What makes us different is that we are priest, prophet, and king. Amen? Okay, king, that you share in the governance, right? You share in the governance of the world, of the temporal order. I, as a priest, share in the governance of the, of the church. You participate in that by participating in, in ministries within the church, reading Eucharistic ministers, parish councils, finance. You share in that governance. But you also share in the governance of the world, in the temporal order, in the governance of your family, in your parental authority, that you set order, right? You create order. That's why the families that, that have no order, that have no rules, have no, it's, it's chaos, right? So you help by your governance, by you sharing as a king, you bring order to that. Uh, you need to pray as, pre, as king uh, for wisdom. How do, again, how do you rule, right? We rule with wisdom. That's why I love Solomon. Solomon, what he asked for, he asked for wisdom. Right? I think particularly as a parent in the world today, or as a grandparent, to figure out how to navigate these waters, good luck. Better you than me, all right? You need, you really need wisdom. We're going to pray this evening about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to us in Isaiah, and wisdom is one of that, right? You need wisdom about how to proceed and how to move forward. You need patience. You need courage. My older brother, both of my older brothers, when they turned 18, they moved out of the house because they didn't like my parents' rules. Those same parents have put rules in their home, right? That they understood now that there is wisdom and there is beauty. One of the, I think one of the things that some quote-unquote charismatic groups is, is it's kind of like anything goes. God is a God of order. He's a God of order. He works in order. And that the, to the degree that we can bring order in our families and order in the areas that we work, that's part of the way we can govern. Amen? Amen. With that being said, uh, I think a father has a particular role in their family. I've done quite a few weddings, and one of the things that I see happening in, in particularly newly married couples is oftentimes it's the young woman who is more formed, um, more prayerful, more thoughtful. And what this creates is her desire that her husband be uh, a, the more of the leader in the family. And there's beginning this tension that exists between this desire that she has on him and an inability of him to be able to follow through with that. Uh, we in the church, men in the church, men in the families need to stop abdicating all that is spiritual to the wife, right? It must be shared, right? To be able to see, I tell a story about my father, my father being a physician, uh, just cool thing. Several of my dad's nurses over the years went through the RSA pro program and became Catholic by the witness that my dad was to them. But I remember as a kid walking into a little chapel one afternoon and my dad was in the front. He had some few minutes between patients and he was kneeling down in the front of the church. Uh, this had an impact on me, right? He's seeing his dad kneeling down praying, right? Fathers need to be able to take that role more seriously. Is, is, is to allow their kids and their spouse to see that. Amen? Amen. They must uh, stop advocating the responsibility of the spiritual life, spiritual well-being of the family, and they need to become the fathers, the priests, the prophets in their own family. Amen? Amen? We need to bring order to the world that we live in. You know, again, the educational uh, committees across the country are just, they're craziness that's going on. Some of the things that are being passed are craziness. If, if Catholic Christians aren't going to be a part of the educational boards, if they're not going to be a part of the social movements, if they're not going to be a part of whatever is going on in your community, then we need to quit whining about it and complaining about how bad things are, right? Part of the role as king is to be a part of the governing of our society. 
And unfortunately, for lots of reasons, we're not being involved in that. So we need to quit complaining about everything being wrong if we're not willing to engage it. Amen? Amen. So you need to be a part of that. And again, you as a layperson has a particular responsibility for that, to be on the education boards, to be part of the PTAs, to be part of Rotaries, and I don't know all these organizations that you should be a part of, but be a part of them. Amen? Amen. Um, if we don't bring that, we don't bring the community. All right, we need to stop. Oh, stop. <laughs> okay, so, so we, we planned um, these, this workshop, we planned maybe a year and a half ago about what I was going to talk about here. What motivated it for me was the mess that we, are, we have in the church right now, is what we have is men and women, priests included, that are not being who we're supposed to be. Right? And, and I take that on myself, and on behalf of priests, I repent for that. And, and I've spent much of the many last years trying to bring order and peace to that. But the reality is, that's all of our story, right? That we are all priests, prophets, and kings, and we need to step into that. And we need to begin to behave as that. We need to begin to live like that. Just be who we are, Amen. Be who we are and who we've created to be in baptism, that we are changed and we need to own that. We need to literally step into that with confidence. Stop cowering, stop hiding, step up to the plate with courage, with grace, with charity, with, with the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit anointing us and be who God has created us to be. Amen? Amen. So to that end, we are going to renew our baptismal vows. There's a method to my madness, right? So I invite you to stand up. Could we do like a, version, a verse of Come Holy Ghost? We could probably get through that, couldn't we? I'm not so confident about this, but let's give it a shot, all right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace and heavenly aid to build our which thou hast made to fill the heart. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. With we come before the Lord this afternoon as baptized priests, prophets, and king, and are being given the opportunity to renew ourselves once again in this baptism, this grace that was given to us, the call that was placed on our life, that we are not uh, merely flesh, but we are flesh and spirit. And as baptized, we are Christ's. We are other Christ's. We are anointed. And as such, we stand, we stand in that grace. That it is not I who lives, rather it's Christ who lives in me. And we pray for the grace to be Christ to a world that so desperately needs to believe. That is looking and longing for someone to worship and that we might be able to be witnesses and example of this Christ who has come to bring life to the world. So I ask you very simple questions, and the answer is, I do. Do you reject Satan? I do. And all of his works? I do. And all of his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, I do. his only Son, our Lord, I do. who was born of the Virgin Mary, I do. crucified, I do. died and was buried, I do. rose again and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father? I do. do you believe in the Holy Spirit, I do. the Holy Catholic Church, I do. the communion of saints, I do. the forgiveness of sins, I do. the resurrection of the dead, I do. and life everlasting? Jesus, I pray your blessing upon my brothers and sisters. God, all-powerful Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us a new birth by water and by the Holy Spirit, and you have forgiven our sins. 
May Almighty God pour out his grace and his blessing upon this community that they would know the faith of Jesus Christ and be continually transformed by him. So let's sing that first verse of Come Holy Ghost again, and I'm going to bless you with holy water that came from Lord's on my trip there this summer. Amen? So sing the verse again. fire of love and sweet anointing from above and sweet anointing from above May almighty god bless you the father the son the holy spirit amen. be who you have been anointed to be amen God bless you guys. You have 30, 25 minutes to get to your next workshop. God bless you guys.